Good morning, everybody. Good what morning. a beautiful day here in this uh, Methow Valley, where we're so blessed to live and walk this land and and hopefully grow some grow some food. So we are here this morning with Annika Mines. I'm Tracy Sprower from Methow at Home. Annika was here last year, and it was a really engaging program. And so. Thank you, Annika, for coming back again. Annika, um, I will let her introduce herself, but Annika and I go a long ways back. Um, Annika started Classroom in Bloom, and when I first met you, Annika, you were working up um, at Sunny Pine, and uh, we both went to Evergreen, so both just have this long, deep love for trying to understand um, the earth and the way of the earth and how to how to live a little bit closer closer to that so with that i'm going to hand it over to you Annika, so you can talk to us all about setting our gardens up for success okay i'm off i'm unmuted um well just to be totally transparent, Tracy and I talked about this ahead of time and I said, I don't think I, I have time to prepare anything. So let's just do question and answer, but I can introduce myself and, but hopefully most of the, most of it will be based around questions you all have rather than, I didn't really prepare a presentation. Um, so my name's Annika and um, I've been farming up Pisk River for a long time. Um, and uh, I, Right now, um, the farm that I have is is uh, based around growing crops for collecting their seeds. And um, I sell seeds in bulk to um, other seed companies that then repackage and sell them. So I'll send like a pound, you know, 20 pounds of carrot seed to uprising seeds and then they repackage it into little envelopes and sell it. Um, but, and then three years ago, I started my own retail seed line called Madhaw Valley Seed Collective um, with some other farmers on Twisk River that you guys may have seen in the local stores. And we're selling um, seed, you know, in small packages ourselves now. Um, and uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I think that this time of year is a fun time to talk about like yeah, what do we do in the garden in the spring to get ready? And what what do we do, you know, when do we plant things? And it's especially poignant this year when I think people look outside and think, oh, it's time to plant things. <laughs> um, even though it's only the beginning of March, which is not when we usually plant things in the Met House. So uh, just because the weather is unusual this year. Um, and is there anything else you can think of to introduce myself, Tracy, that... Uh, no, I think, I think that sounds good. Yeah. Annika, you've been in the Valley for most of the time, but you did, uh, leave for a minute to go learn about the seed farming and that's, that's its own journey. And if anyone is interested in more of the specifics on what it means to be a seed farmer, you can go to the Met How at Home YouTube channel and watch, watch the program from last year, because we've really dove deeply into that. This this year, what we talked about, Annika, is that you sharing your your schedule and how you tend to your soil and how you decide which seeds to yeah. plant. That's what we mm -hmm. talked about. Yeah, so um, I, unfortunately, I didn't, like I said, I didn't prepare. This is going to be impossible to see without... Uh, um me making it digital for you but this is what i use to decide when to plant things this is a chart i made myself and basically what it's what it shows is um i have a a greenhouse you know where i can grow starts and you can do that on your kitchen table you know as long as it's somewhere where ideally it doesn't freeze at night um and and then I also have a big tunnel of plastic. We call them high tunnels, um, but like, you know, 25 feet wide, 100 feet long that um, I can plant things in a lot earlier than you can plant outside because it's protected. Um, 
And so I have on my chart, like when I plant things um, inside and when I plant things outside. Um, and so <clears throat> I guess the, just for those of you who, how many of you raise your hand if you are on video, like grow a, you know, me moderate sized garden already at your home, like moderate size, meaning like more than like one bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can see a few people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, if, you know, in terms of like this time of year, so what we're at March 13th, no, oh, it's my brother's birthday. Um, it's, um, uh, it, it's not that I haven't planted very many things yet. So even though it looks like warm outside and sunny, like, and you're like, oh my God, should I have already started? Should I have already done something? Am I too late? It's definitely not too late. Um, the only things I've planted so far are leeks and onions. Um, and then I also, uh, I plant um, a few like let it, head lettuce starts in my, um, you know, in trays this time of year to be transplanted into my high tunnel. It's a little too early for that to be transplanted outside. So if you don't have a place indoors to transplant to, it's still too early even for lettuce starts. Yeah. So are you starting those in your greenhouse now? Yeah. So I have two greenhouses. I have one that's small and like and insulated and doesn't freeze at night which mm -hmm. for a, you know, a gardener could just be somewhere inside your house, like next to a window. Yes. And then I have a, a tunnel outside that freezes at night, but is a lot warmer during the day and just stays warmer longer. And so you can kind of get an extension for, of the, of the season. I wonder if I could show you. We have a green, we have a greenhouse that now during the day, is showing 60 degrees during the day yeah yeah it should any kind of planting. greenhouse should do that during the day at this point because um uh yeah as as long as there's sun shining through i mean it's just like your car you know it gets more than 60 degrees inside your car <laughs> just sitting in the sun right um and limiting yeah. factor is what happens at night right and so until it and yeah just needing to have a space that doesn't freeze at night for the starts but for, for the, the stuff starts. like yeah for stuff like lettuce um and i'm looking for a yeah we want to plant lettuce and green onions and some arugula, that sort of thing. Um, I got to get back to, I, I left Zoom and now I can't find you guys. I'm sorry. I'm oh, here. we are okay, here. We are. <laughs> um, so yeah, arugula. So the things that I plant, I have a little um, Tupperware that I carry around in the spring. I'm going to show it to you right here because it's always near me. Because there's, um, it's like when I'm in the greenhouse, I want to always have access to these seeds and they are arugula <laughs> and cilantro, lettuce, um, lettuce mix. So this is like a whole bunch of, since I grow my own seed, I have access to a very large amount of seed. So I don't have to worry about wasting my seeds. This is a mustard mix that my son grew dragon feathers. And what else do I have in here? Um, so this is, yeah, so those are the much. Most things. Oh, spinach. So spinach, mustards, and arugula, cilantro, and lettuce are the things that I like have with me because I want to do lots of successions in the spring and all my different places that I can, you know, have early stuff. Um, and that includes, you know, some people put like a box on their windowsill just with soil in it, just like a wooden box and just plant lettuce. You know, you can do that in your house starting like February 15th. It starts to get to be enough day length that, um, you know, that, that you can grow a little. It's going to be leggy. It's not going to be super 
Um, do you, know, you guys know what leggy means? If when you if you don't grow stuff outside, if it's like in a window and only gets some light during the day, it's gonna kind of like reach for the sun and it's gonna be sort of thinner and less like you know how sometimes greens are like thick and crunchy and sometimes they're like paper and they're like not that good. That thinner papery thing is you know it's hard to avoid that if you don't have like full light. Um, but those are the things that I have in my early greens box. And um, <clears throat> those are the things that I plant that I've already planted in my high tunnel and that I've, I have, um, you know, I have on hand ready for like my first planting, but the things that I've planted inside my small greenhouse um, that are for planting outside are just onions and um, leeks. Yeah. And shallots, I, if you grow shallots from seed. And then there's also, um, like if you got, d does anyone like grow perennial flowers and things like that? Cause those, there's some, a lot of perennial flowers you need to stratify the seed, um, which means you have to get it cold for at least two, usually, or better yet four weeks before you, um, before it will grow. And mm -hmm. so it's good if you have like perennial flowers that you want to grow and a few annuals like larkspur and bells of Ireland. And there's a number of annuals. So you can look it up online. Does this seed need cold stratification? I do it like every year. Every time I get a new seed, I type that into Google. Does, does such and such need cold stratification? Especially if you try one year and it doesn't grow. That's like 90% of the time the reason it didn't work is it needs cold stratification. And then if it does, all you have to do is you take the seeds and you put it on a paper towel in a in a little Ziploc, moisten the paper towel and put the Ziploc in the refrigerator for oh. um, two to four weeks. And then when you then take that out and take the seeds and put them in your little pot or um, and, and they'll grow. Another way to cold stratify is just to plant really early. Um, the problem with that, so so if you put it outside right now, it's going to get cold stratified because it's colder than a refrigerator every night and it will be for the next two months. So there's plenty of opportunity to cold stratify outside. Um, if you plant now or in the fall, even you can plant a lot of things in the fall and they'll just sit there and they'll get cold stratified just being out in the winter. That's Annika? Yeah. If, if you have bought commercial seed, can you assume it's been cold stratified? The seed company can't cold stratify it for you. Cold stratification happens mo in a moist environment. Okay. So it can't be cold stratified dry. Okay. So it's it's up to the gardener to do it. Um, the oh, seed yes. company can't do it for you. Because um, you need you need to put it either in a... The choices are put it in a moist paper towel in the fridge, or you can like fill a little pot with soil, get it wet, put the seeds in there, and then just put that outside. A lot of times put saran wrap over it so you don't have to remember to water it just to make sure it stays wet and just leave it outside. Like right now I have two trays. I have anise hyssop and motherwort, which are both perennials that need cold stratification. I just sewed all the trays I want and I just left it outside and I'm going to leave it out there for about four weeks and then I'll bring it into the greenhouse and then it'll germinate. How much do you keep, do you just keep it moist? It, may, you... it should stay moist because cold stratification evolved, you know, from wild, the wild because perennials uh, or any really annuals too, when you drop your seed, you're sitting under the snow for the whole winter. And um, so usually plants that evolved in like temperate climates, a lot of them need cold stratification, not all of them, but a lot of them do. Um, there's a lot of seeds we sow that don't need that. Um, and they either came from tropical climates where they, there is no winter really, there's just wet and dry seasons. Right. And then, um, or they just, for whatever reason have their germination is just stimulated by, you know, other factors than being cold and then warm again, which is what cold stratification means. Um, Diane's asking which annuals need cold stratification. Um, I mean, I can, I can try to come up with a, a list of things that I can think of, but it would, the easiest thing is to 
write in Google what annuals need cold stratification and a list will pop up for you. But the things that I grow that are annuals that need cold stratification that I can think of off the top of my head, none of them are vegetables. They're all flowers, pretty much. Bells of Ireland, Larkspur. Um, what other annuals? God, I feel like most of the things I cold stratify are perennials. Um, those are the only two annuals I can think of on the top of my head. Yeah, because echinacea likes it, but that's a perennial. No um, wonder. Yeah, I most of them are perennials. <laughs> What's that? I didn't know this, and I never have good luck with with uh, per, so many perennials. I'm so glad to know this. Thank you, Olga. Yeah. No, I think it's been one of the biggest things for me because a lot of times, you know, because I'm growing these seeds on contract, and so... I have to, I'm supposed to get a certain amount. And then I sow all these seeds, put them in the greenhouse and they don't grow. And then like, because I have to collect seed, they, I need the whole season. And so if they don't grow and I have to try again and again, and then I, I can't get them to germinate, then like the contract's blown. And so it's like been this, it's taken years of learning curve of like every time <clears throat> remember check if they need cold stratification before you try, because if you try and then fail and have to put them in the fridge for four weeks and then they germinate, then you've lost the time you need to get them to go to seed. So it's a big, it's a huge issue for me, especially as I've gotten into more and more herbs and flowers, which I love doing. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's magic. Like <clears throat> a couple years ago, two years ago, I remember I had a larkspur crop and uh, Kelly McMillan, who's my neighbor and who's also a farmer, was using my greenhouse. She she puts some stuff in my greenhouse um, because she doesn't have a, a good setup at hers <clears throat> and um, for the early stuff when it's still really cold. <clears throat> she had larkspur that wasn't germinating at all. And then she was like, Can, do you have any extra larkspur seed? I used all mine up. It didn't germinate. And all I had was the cold stuff I'd cold stratified left over and I opened a paper towel that had been in the fridge. I had already planted mine and the, all the seeds had germinated in the fridge on the paper towel. Wow. And they just really <laughs> like being cold when they're germinating, which is like, you don't think of that. You think just warm soil, right? But not everything likes warm soil to germinate, especially flour. So yeah, that was a big learning. Can we what about, back on, oh, sorry. What about beets? Beets? I've, nev I've uh, never had luck germinating beets. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, they do not need cold stratification and they do not need cold soil. I think they need cool, like they're not um, adapted to really hot, you know, like some things like zucchini, tomato, pepper, eggplant. Um, they all want like, or melon, they'd all want the warmest soil you could get, you know, up to a point, of course to, to germinate, um, beets, carrots, and, you know, um, they're, they're not wanting that, the, you know, 80 degree soil, but they definitely don't, you know, germinate well, if it's like 60 degrees either. So it, I oh, think okay. one issue you might have is you're planting them too early before there's enough, the soil's warmed enough. So that's one possibility because nothing will germinate, not even peas really very well, if it's really cold and spinach even. Those are two that pretty much like cool soil, but they still like, if it's really cold, it's just hard to start growing for plants unless you're Larkspur, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'd say one issue could be that you're planting them too early when the soil is really cold. Um, and um, I guess what else could be with beet germination? I mean, of course, the quality of the seed is really important. If the seed is yeah high quality, it you know it's more likely to germinate. Um, and um, I the, usually uh, use baker seeds, so I've trusted them for many years. Uh huh. Yeah, Baker like, Creek. Uh, baker Creek. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. No, I think that's that they should that should be quality seed. I mean. It's not my favorite company, but um, for various reasons, but I, I think they're, they're, their quality is decent. I haven't um, bought seed from them in a long time, but um, I, yeah, I think it's positive. Do you plant really early? Uh, no, not particularly because I live up at 2400. So um, I usually wait till it's warmed up. 
yeah or anything uh, like that yeah yeah hmm. um then but, but i had bad luck on the west side too so with, with beats. beats yeah yeah huh. i, I mean, just don't girl them, i guess <laughs> I, yeah, I, no, I i think... really i really want them for the greens which doesn't really work over here that well yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I agree. Sometimes beets have really nice greens, and but it's like a, I feel like it's kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes they just are have pretty lame greens. Yeah. I mean, you try growing chard; it's the same species, and it's just the greens. <laughs> mm. um, but I didn't have much luck with that either. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't, I, well, I one water. thing with <laughs> yeah, one thing with chard that's different is that you can you can't really transplant root crops like beets and carrots, but chard. <clears throat> no. you can, grow in in trays and uh and then you should have better luck with oh okay i'll try that yeah, yeah i don't i don't transplant much because i'm i'm a klutz and i don't do well transplanting so i usually plant direct yeah well you could try just do you know sewing like a six pack of of chard and and um seeing if you can get it to germinate you know on the windowsill and then and then trying transplanting it and seeing if you can get get it to grow um okay yeah um but yeah beets i don't know i i find there's a few things that i feel like i'm just like are easy and i just do well at and there's a few things that are just like the bane of my existence and i don't understand why i can't do better and i don't know what it is maybe right. it's kind of like fairy that goes into the ground and messes up the ones beets are for me are very inconsistent like sometimes i'll have amazing beet crops but i'd say that's like a quarter of the time and three quarters of the time it's like all over the map like really bad don't germinate or just like really sparse and they're okay half of them are giant and half of them are like <laughs> tiny little like bb's like, you know? like my garlic on this side yeah. <laughs> tiny <laughs> yeah garlic it feels for me really consistent on this side um i um I just, there's another question yeah. in here but, I see a question in the chat, but before I address that, which I can, um, I would, I want to, I just want to address one other thing that has to do is, is similar to stratification that took me a, multiple years to, um, to learn that has to do with chard. So I want to let you know who I can't, okay. you're, whoever was just talking is just iPhone two on my computer. So I'm not sure who that was. Gretchen. Is that Gretchen? That's, yeah, it's Gretchen. Okay. Gretchen. So with chard uh, and a couple other things, I'm going to say chard, mm. napa cabbage, bok choy. Um, there's uh, there's actually an issue with this other thing. So we have stratification, which is for seeds. They need to be cold for a certain amount of time before they'll germinate. Now there's this other word, vocabulary word, vernalization. What, which, is, what is it? It's called, it's vernalization. So oh. basically winter, I think, you know, winterizing uh -huh. um, and so um vernalization means um plants a lot of plants um are biennial so they grow vegetative growth in one year and then the next year um after they've been through a winter they go to seed okay so there's a lot a lot of crops that have that quality anything root you know beets carrots onions um radishes um and the vernalization requirement for um something brassicas are like that too but broccoli cabbage cauliflower um you know kale all kinds of mustard greens and things and i've found with chard bok choy and napa cabbage particularly that they have a what's what we call a low vernalization requirement, which means they don't need to be cold for very long before they'll go to seed. And if I plant my Napa cabbage or bok choy or chard too early in like say middle of April or um, you know, even yeah, I'd say if I plant before like April 15th, it almost always ends up getting vernalized in the like 20 days that it's cold in the spring before it warms up enough and then it goes right to seed and then I don't get a, a nice leafy crop off of it um that happened to me for years with napa cabbage I'm like why is my napa cabbage always going to seed before I can eat it 
And finally I figured out I was planting it too early and it, it, it thought it had already, it thought it had been through a winter um, when it actually hadn't. And I wanted it to make a nice head and it didn't really ever make a nice head. It would just sort of like make a half head and then boop, go to seed. And that happened to me with chard a bunch too. And I finally realized, oh, I have to plant my chard after, I'm going to say April 15th, but I'm not sure that's, yeah, something like that. Like you got to get your, those three crops out a little later. Don't try to push the window on them too much. Better to put them out like May 1st. Yeah, I had that with now. That makes sense? Yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Um I have I one can other answer this question down here too, if you want, or did you want something else, Tracy? Well, I was going to go back to the planting the greens in six, you know, when you go to plant in succession, mm. how, how much do you plant each time, you know, for like a family of two? Yeah. Um, so I'm bad at that. You know, I always end up with too much food that I can't eat. Um, because it's just hard to plant little enough, honestly. And it's hard to eat everything. You have a whole bunch of like, yeah, you, that you do all this work and then you harvest it, which is also a, a, another point that's important to address with gardening. You harvest it and put it in the fridge. And then a week later, you put it in the compost. <laughs> you can't eat it all. It's it's like, why did I do all that work? You know, um, but I think for me, I've come to discover that like, for, you know, there's different things. There's successions of like head lettuce that I plant in little pots and then I plant out as individual plants so that I can get a whole head. And then there's lettuce mix that I plant like in little rows and I'm cutting like as little baby leaves, right? So from, I'd say for me and I only, it's just me and my son half the time. So it's definitely a small amount of people to feed. I, um, I would say like, each succession of lettuce would be like five bed feet, you know, of like, because you can cut it twice or three times. And then, um, and then if you also have a little succession of rugula and a little succession of maybe I like to plant like baby kale, like, uh, cause I have a lot of seeds. So it's easy for me to just like sprinkle a whole bunch of, and so if I have like five feet of each one of those things that ends up, you know, 15 feet and it's, it's a lot and you can cut it multiple times. Um, and then I'll plant like two six packs, like every three weeks or something. So that's 12 heads of lettuce. Um, and then you put them out and then, you know, three weeks later you plant more and then you put those out when they're ready. And then you have kind of an ongoing, but you, you know, if you have room for that amount, but it doesn't like 12 heads of lettuce literally takes like Three bed feet. I mean, depending on how wide your beds are, but you can plant them like 10 inches apart in a grid. And, you know, it's not that much space to 12 heads of lettuce because they when, when they're fully grown, they can be touching. You know, you want that actually because it's better for weed competition. So, um, you know, planting them densely, especially if you're a small gardener, is helpful because it uses less space and they compete with the weeds and you don't want your head lettuce to get giant because then you can't finish it if you only have a family of two to feed, you know? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, 12 heads is way too much for a small family because they, they all, and if you plant a whole bunch of different kinds too, they'll come ripe at different times. So you can, you don't want them all to come ripe at the same time because then you can't eat 12 heads of lettuce in one week, you know? It's, it's hard. I have not mastered like getting the exact right amount of food for my family. That's for sure. <laughs> I have one other question about, um, let's say that uh, somebody does decide, oh, I, I do want to plant a box, you know, in my window or something like that and mm -hmm. to uh, just grow at home. What do you do for drainage and how do you set that up for success? Do you put rocks in the bottom or... Mm. I've, like. um, I've never done that inside my house. Um, so I don't have experience The I do have a box that's full of soil in my small greenhouse that I can plant in. And I just built like a ply, like a, I just put like a plywood bottom that I drilled a bunch of holes in, mm -hmm. uh, and then like cedar sides, um, 
and filled it with potting soil. Um, mm -hmm. And, but inside a house, I think, yeah, I know Kelly had one in her old house and that's, that's kind of the inspiration I remember. She taught me like Valentine's day is the earliest it's worth planting even inside your house because there's just the day it's, it's up to, it's about the day length. There's just not enough sun and, and things don't grow well, no matter how warm you keep your house. If there's not sun, that's the sun is what causes photosynthesis, not the warmth. So if you don't have enough hours of the day with sun and it's, it's pointless. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't really know. I mean, I don't know how that, I mean, if you were designing a new house, you could easily design it with like some kind of, you know, tile floor under the, the area you want to put your box so that, you know, if it did drain, it wouldn't be drain rotting out any wood or anything, but I don't, um, I haven't really done that. Yeah. You'd have to figure out a way to manage the water, of course. Um, but you know, it's like a house, you know, we have house plants and we figure it out. So it's, po I'm sure it's possible. <laughs> hey, Annika. Yeah, Susan. Can, can you talk to us about um, this, the direct seed stuff, carrots and parsnips and how to, <laughs> what's like the watering protocol to get the best germination? I've had not the greatest germination with carrots and. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, parsnips and carrots, but especially parsnips are pretty hard to germinate consistently. And, um, I am not the master of that. I think, um, if you're growing a small patch, I would recommend, um, you know, doing it sometime between, you know, April 15th and May 1st to get like the best, like biggest parsnips by the end of the season. Cause they're a pretty long season. And, but you could do it up to May 15th and still get a, a good crop off of them. Um, and then I would, you don't want it to be hot. They don't want to be germinating in super hot weather. I had the worst and same with carrots. I, I, I planted my whole season's worth of, like my whole winter storage worth of carrots during that like heat dome, because oh. when has it ever been that right. hot in June? Like June is cold. It's January usually here. So you can basically through June, you can plant it. Yeah. And so I sowed my carrots because I usually sow my storage carrots mid middle of June to late June because well, I take care of them. They'll get big either way. Um, you can plant them earlier if you want, but, um, anyway, and then it got super hot and I, it was horrible germination. They just do not like being super hot when they're trying to germinate and you can't bury them very deep. You know, a carrot seed doesn't want to be buried more than a quarter inch. Um, and same with a parsnip seed. So the parsnips, I recommend, Susan, they have, you want them to keep them wet. Parsnips take at least 20 days to germinate. It's a very slow germinator. So you want to, I would recommend putting a piece of reme over it. If you can get your okay. hand. Okay. Yeah. Because that will help keep it from drying out if you forget one day to water it. Um, and <clears throat> you know, it's not really for warmth. It's more just for like moisture retention. And, um, and then you can just, you know, lay it on the ground. You don't need hoops or anything. Just lay the Rimei on the ground. Rimei is, is a brand name for what we call row cover, which is like a really light fabric that you can put on plants to protect them from insects and to warm them up a tiny bit. And in this case, it would be for moisture retention. Um, but yeah, and then you can just water right on, on top of the Rimei, like water goes through it. Um, and so that will help your germination. If you don't have Rimei, it's fine. Just you do have to keep it wet for 20, 21 days. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> that, so the trick, there's a couple things with that. One is that if you, when things take a really long time to germinate and they're direct sown and you have a lot of weeds, it can be tricky because if you're not really, if you're not really experienced and you don't know what a parsnip seedlings looks like, and then a whole bunch of weeds come up with yeah. your parsnip yeah. seedlings, you're like, where's the parsnips? I have no idea how to even find them because there's, it took 21 days for the parsnips to come up and only five days for the weeds to come up, you know, and the, <laughs> the weeds are bigger than the seedlings that you're trying to keep. So that's really tricky with these slow germinating things that are direct sown. Um, and so I think one one way to remedy that is to like make your bed uh you know as early as you can it depends on the year but this year you could make your bed april 1st that you're going to plant parsnips on it rake it out water it 
and then leave it for three weeks and just let all the weeds that are on the very surface germinate and then gently hoe them so you're not stirring the soil up because you don't want if you stir the soil up new weed seeds will come to the surface so try not to stir the soil up too much just if you have like a I don't know if you guys ever use um, scuffle hose or hula hose, the kind of hoe that's, it's not like a blade like this. It's 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 a little, or another name for it is stirrup hoe. It's just like a little metal stirrup and it's a blade and it just kind of scooches along the soil surface and cuts the roots of the weeds off. You can just go really high to the surface and just sort of scrape them. Um, and you can do that with a regular hoe too, but just scrape, you just want to scrape the surface and kill all those weeds. And then, you know, then you can plant your parsnips and hopefully you'll have a little bit less of like an explosion of weeds with the germination of these slower germinating crops. Does that make sense? Could you add soil to your beds um, after you weed? Could you add some good soil to the top of it? Well, if um, you could, you um, if you would, your would that be in to try to for weed? No, what, just, what would be the point? Of, just, I would do that first, unless it's. Um, so if you're if you're trying to like amend, I would do all whatever you're going to do to your bed for your parsnips. I do it April first if you can, or just, you know, at the earliest. So add your compost. You don't want to add a lot of nitrogen fertilizer for root crops. Nitrogen fertilizer is not good for root crops. You want to add compost and you want to, you know, you want to do some tilting for parsnips because it's a long root. So you want to like fork it a little bit, you know, get some, what we call tilt, like fluff the soil and rake it and then have it be totally ready for what you, when you want to plant and then let the weeds grow and then kill the weeds. You could also, I mean, if you have like a little propane torch, you could kill them with that too. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and that really wouldn't disturb the soil, right? I mean, people do that. And that's actually, um, that's something people do, like farmers do with carrots and beets after they've sowed them. Like you can sow them and a week later, do a little propane torch, kill all the little seedlings. And then you've you've you're even farther ahead with like not competing with your um with your crop um but that's kind of varsity level just <laughs> just like yeah you want to prep your bed exactly how you're as if you're ready to sow your parsnips but don't sow them let the wheat grow hoe them and then plant your parsnips because if you start adding compost, your compost is definitely going to have weeds in it unless you buy like sterile, totally sterile compost, I, I, which I guess maybe for a small gardener, you might buy it all in bags. But I, if I'm going to use my own compost, it's going to, I'm going to be putting weed seeds onto my bed because my compost has weeds in it. Um, or if you use manure from like any local farm or anything, they're all it's going to, manure has a lot of weed seeds in it. So you're going to be adding new weeds into the situation if you put manure or you know like horse manure or cow manure or compost from your own compost pile um, so Annika there's some uh quite a few questions okay. All right. let's, here. Let's, let's um yeah so the first one to get back to is which seeds are good beyond the expiration date on the envelope yeah um <laughs> this is this is like the perennial question and uh <laughs> It's just really kind of impossible to answer because now as I've gotten more and more into being a seed company, I've learned more and more about, you know, how the business works and seeds, um, the, there's rule, you know, the USDA has rules about seeds. And basically the rule is the seed has to pass a certain germination standard the year that it's sold when you receive it. But that has no regard to when it was grown. So I could sell 10 year old seed to you if it passes germination, which, um, and so if, if I have, I actually did uh, this, just so you know, I had a paprika, a Hungarian paprika that was still at 70% germination. 10 years old. And I was like, I got to grow this back out, but I'm going to sell it one more year until I get a new crop. So I, last year I grew a new crop of this 
uh, Bulldog Hungarian Paprika. So now the seed that I'm selling this year is fresh, brand new. But it's, it doesn't germinate that much better than the 10-year-old seed did. Um, but once that seed's 10 years old, it's going to start deteriorating more quickly than this fresh seed. This seed, if you bought my paprika seed this year, you could probably keep it for 10 years and it would still have good germination. But if you bought it last year, it might have bad germination after one or two years. Does that make sense? So you just don't know when you buy from a seed company, they're not telling you what year they grew the seed or they don't grow the seed. What year I grew the seed and sold it to them. <laughs> Most seed companies don't grow their own seed. Um, and so um, it's really tricky. There is like rules. If you read about, like if you, you Google this, you, mean, you can Google anything you're asking me, but um, I just really, I just read someone's blog, another seed company's blog on this very question a couple of days ago. And they were like, they said the same thing everyone says, which is onions one to two years and um, brassicas four to five years and tomatoes five to six years or whatever. But it just depends on how old the seed was when you got it. And we don't know that. So there's just really no way to know. And in my opinion, if your seed is like more than like say seven years old, just toss it. Mm -hmm. Unless you really care about it and it's like a variety you love and you can't get any more, then plant a more, you know, plant more seeds than you think you need. And hopefully some of them will grow. If it's less than seven years old, you can germination test it yourself. Um, by <clears throat> same thing with the cold stratification, take a paper towel, put some seeds on it, wet it, fold the paper towel in half, put it in a Ziploc bag and leave it somewhere that's like 70 degrees, like you know, just on top of your counter in your kitchen. And then look, you know, check on it um, in a week and see, you know, depending on what kind of seed it is. I mean, the germination testing is a whole nother thing, but just a rough germination test just to see if any of them grow, you know. Mm. You can do that if it's something you really care about. If it's old and you don't mind just paying four more dollars and getting more, just get more, you know. Um, or but so it has. That's not a very good, it's not, a, it's not, that answer is not very helpful. But I mean, the truth is all the stuff you read about online, like from my perspective is kind of all BS because you just don't know how old the seed was when you bought it. So it doesn't matter if you have some idea about onion seed, only, you know, last this long. And it's not even true. I've had almost all my onion lots in the last few years have lasted like eight years. And it always says onions one to two years. Everything you read online says onions only last one to two years. It's just not true. So I, I, I have a I have a seed purchasing addiction. Yeah. And I often grow 10 year old or the date on the package is 10 years old. Yeah. Nope. No big deal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's great. No, I think that that's, there was a lot of fabulous information in that answer. Thank you, Annika. Yeah. Um, here's, here's another big one. Um, okay. uh, just talk a little bit more, of, and you've mentioned some things, but yeah, what, what do you do for your bed prep and, yeah. and weed control? Okay. Um, what are you doing right now? Right now, I haven't really done anything in the garden at all. I've only pruned like I pruned my raspberries and my fruit trees is all I've done outside. Um, you know, and then I've, like I said, I planted onions inside. Um, and well, I did prep the beds in the high tunnel for, for the, um, for, and what I do for, I pretty much do, I do mostly the same thing for everything except for roots, like parsnips, beets, and carrots. Um, I don't put, I put either very little or no nitrogen in those beds. Um, and then same, okay, so there's there's those, the roots, which you don't want nitrogen um, because you want them, nitrogen is the thing that feeds um, leafy growth. And of course you want them to have some nitrogen because they need their leaves in order to make photosynthesis happen to like put sugar into their, into their roots if they're a carrot, say. But if there's too much nitrogen, they end up getting like branches and hairy and like they don't have that nice cylinder carrot. And um, and so they just don't want a lot of nitrogen. Um, so that's, that's root crops. Compost, 
Um, what I do in my garden is I use a, a broad fork. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with a broad fork. I know I, I should, this would be, I wish I had like all my tools here I could show you, uh, but you could Google it. It's just like, a, instead of just a little digging fork, it's like a big digging fork with a big broad top that you can step on. And it, it's, mine is like, I don't know, probably 24 inches wide. And you just kind of get it into the soil and then you just kind of flip it back and it just it gives it a little bit of tilt. It gives fluff, but it doesn't turn things over. And mm. the, the prevailing idea about garden soil is that less disturbance is better because there's a whole ecosystem inside that soil that is, um, you know, alive and disturbing it just makes it all have to like reorganize itself. Um, so what I do is I get in there with digging forks and a broad fork too. And I, if there's a lot of weeds, like perennial weeds from the year before, quack grass, mallow, things that will still be um, dandelions is the th things that I usually have the most of in the spring, quack grass, dandelions, and mallow. I'll get in there and I'll dig those out and then I'll put compost on it. And I'll put, I usually use a, like a pelletized chicken waste kind of high nitrogen stuff. And I don't use that much of it. You can get it at the feed store. There's a Nutri Rich is a brand they sell at the feed store that I think is good. And I just sprinkle some of that on. And that's then I take the broad fork and I kind of like just sort of gently disturb, you know, deep to kind of create fluff. And then I rake it. And that and then it's ready to plant. Um, I also use a tractor on some of my commercial parts. Um, but I do not use like a, a mechanic. I don't use a motorized tiller in my garden. Um, but um, yeah, and I think a lot of people are of the opinion that you don't. Yeah, I don't know. I read a lot online and I, I'm curious about people who say they don't till at all, like not even like broad forking is even considered tilling to some people. Um, and they just like weed and add compost and then just plant right into the bed. I don't know if maybe they don't have snow. I don't know how their bed is beds aren't like compact. You know, I think it's hard to get a nice long. I find that like I can get just the most beautiful, long, big carrots if I do some deep, deep, for, you know, tilling, uh, not tilling, but deep forking just to make sure that it's like nice and loose and they can just grow down. Seems to be helpful in my opinion to do that. Um, and, um, yeah. And the comp, you know, you can buy compost, you can make compost. You can also get manure from, um, you know, your neighbors who have farm animals, um, most manures are there's very little manure that's going to like burn your crops um if you just apply it you know even without a whole lot of composting um because you know unless it's chicken that's like not mixed with hardly any bedding it's most of the other animals like sheep cows horses their manure isn't really that hot 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 means has a lot of nitrogen and hot, super hot manure can like, they say burn your crops. And I actually don't even really know what that means because I've never seen it. But if there's too much nitrogen, it can like make your plants really unhappy. Apparently I've never really seen it happen. I feel like when I planted like some brassicas, like some Brussels sprouts and broccolis into like a pile of chicken manure that I'd shoveled onto a part of my garden the, the fall before, and it was just like a pile. It wasn't really fully decomposed. They were just the happiest things in the world. They grew like my Brussels sprouts were like four feet tall, you know, just because they love nitrogen. You know, I don't, it didn't burn them. It just made them like gigantic. So I don't really have a lot of experience with like too much nitrogen being an issue. I've never really experienced that. Um, so How let's see. Mulch, do you? Do you mulch? Do you sheet mulch? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I don't do a ton of mulching. I'm sorry, I just 
I have to turn my oven off. Um, I, um, I do, there's a couple things that I mulch. Um, I don't know if any of y'all grow leeks, but I discovered about three years ago that my leek success like quadrupled with one little technique, which is that I plant, I prep my bed, I plant my leeks, and then about, and that's happens, you know, around May 1st, cause that's when I get water. It's hard for me to plant anything before my irrigation ditch comes on. So everything in my life is centered around May 1st. <laughs> um, and then about let them get established. So about two, three weeks later, when it's time to mow the lawn, maybe for the first, maybe for the second time, depending on how meticulous people are with their lawns, bag the lawn clippings, like if you have a mower with a bag, I bag the lawn clippings, I bring it over to my leeks and I put like two to two inches of grass clippings all over my leek bed in between every plant, in between every row, in between every plant. One time, literally the first time I did that, I went out a week later and the leeks were like three times as big as they'd been when I put the grass clips. I mean, they just absolutely loved it. And then I had huge leaks at the end of the season that kept in my root cellar all winter. I mean, it's just like, uh, it was a revolution in leaks for me in the Met house because leaks are kind of a more of a West side -y crop. They just, they really like, like cool or moister conditions. And I've, I always had like kind of puny leaks that didn't keep well. And as ever since then, I've had the best leak. So that's my one like huge mulching success. I feel like every other mulching I do is like, moderately to not successful like so like raspberry you know perennials a lot of times like raspberries i'll put cardboard and down and wood chips you know to try to kind of like keep the weeds out and just keep the soil cool and it's great but then like after like not even two years the quack grass comes in you know it's like cardboard and mulch just does not keep perennial weeds out very well and then it's harder to weed because you have all this stuff in there, like in the way of weeding. And I'd still do it. It's just like not as helpful as you want it to be. Um, I do believe in sheet mulching as a preliminary step, like not on crops, but if you have a bunch of weeds in some area and you want to put a garden in, I highly recommend instead of doing a ton, unless you're on a you know tight time scale, but try to think a couple year, a year or two ahead if you put a bunch of cardboard down and cover it with some manure um, and, you know, some compost and manure and maybe some wood chips on top of that, leave it for a whole season and a whole winter and maybe another season if you have two seasons to do this. This is a good friend of mine did this in her garden in town. Instead of, you know, like prepping an area, she just covered it in cardboard, manure, wood chips, covered it in a bunch of organic matter, left it for two years. And then the third year made beds and stuff. Cause the, after two years, the cardboard's pretty much decomposed. You'll find tape and stuff in there, but um, you can just put that in the garbage when you're digging. But we, I helped her prep her garden and she planted it. It was the most amazing garden. It was so productive um, and no, no work, like trying to dig up all the quack grass and everything. You have perennial weeds and stuff. I think that's the best way to prep an area for a new garden or just not perennial weeds, just like grass or pasture or, you know, grass is really hard to get rid of. Um, if you're just like digging it all the time, because once you put crops in there, then you can't dig because you're going to dig up your own, your crops. So then you're trying to like tease it out and it's just really hard and it's really, so if you can, if, and, and, and you get this huge, organic matter and fertility benefit from doing that sheet mulching on top of killing all the weeds. So it's awesome. I highly recommend that as a mulching. I do not recommend mulching hot crops, um, especially like tomatoes and peppers, um, because you don't, you just really don't want to cool the soil around them. They, they're already have a, you know, a short window to do their thing in the met how, and you just, if you, cool off the soil around them. And especially if you use straw or something that's light colored and you're just like making it a cooler environment for them. That's not what they want. They want to be hot. 
Um, and they even want their roots to be hot. And so if you put a bunch of um, mulch on, on around them, they're going to be cooler. And that's good for some things, but not for tomatoes and peppers. Um, I think that I would, if I had more time, I would, and more mulch, <laughs> I would, I would mulch, uh, my, uh, some other things more like asparagus. I would mulch more, um, and brassic, any kind of, uh, brassica. So broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, because that they do want to be cool and it's hard for them to be cool enough in this climate. All the brassicas, they end up getting tons of aphids. I don't know if how many of you have grown much broccoli, but broccoli and cabbage, they just are, there's no way to avoid like issues of aphids on them because they just don't like being hot and they get stressed and then pests love stressed out plants. Um, and so the pests come when they, they can like sense the plants are stressed out. Um, and so if you can, if you can mold, I would, I would definitely like, if I had a lot of grass clippings and a small garden, I would just like cover my brassicas with same as I, what I do with the leeks. I would cover my brassicas with that too, with grass clippings. Cause the grass clippings actually have a lot of nitrogen too. Like fresh green grass clippings are going to give a boost of nitrogen to your plants. And they're going to cool the soil and they're going to, you know, cover up, you know, they, they do some weed prevention. Um, the weeds will grow through them. You're still going to have to weed. Um, no matter how much you mulch, weeds are very helpful. I have personally have never bought into the idea of putting wood chips on my garden beds. Um, I find that wood chips basically um wood chips rob the soil of nitrogen temporarily because um the way decomposition works is you need 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen for decomposition to happen and wood chips are like 60 parts carbon <laughs> so for each, you know, as it decomposes to get that 30 to 1 ratio it's going to have to steal nitrogen from the soil to get the nitrogen it needs to decompose. And if you do that during the season while you also have your crops there, you're gonna end up stealing nitrogen from your crops. And I don't recommend putting, I, I wouldn't do it. I, you could find, I'm sure you'll find very successful gardeners out there who do it, but I don't do it. <laughs> and I've never seen in all my travels, wood chip covered gardens that look healthy to me. Um, Perennials, yeah. Perennials, fruit trees, raspberries. Um, okay, good. <laughs> but yeah. Um, but like hay, like fresh green, like hay or green grass is not going to rob nitrogen because it has more nitrogen. But really brown things like wood chips, they're just brown. That means it's almost all carbon. So. Uh -huh. I mean, I guess compost is brown, but it's like dark brown <laughs> and it's already composted. So it's not going to steal nitrogen. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to look at the chat unless someone has more. Yeah, the next one is when should we plant outdoor seeds like carrots, peas, green beans, tomatoes? Yeah. Um, I. <clears throat> um, so I will tell you, I mean, I guess since I didn't like make a slide or anything, um, I can just tell you what I do for, for first planting for things. And, um, and it's, you know, I would say, I would say that for the most part, I'd stick to it regardless of the weather, because you just never know, like, unless you have, are interested in experimenting and like, it's okay if it dies because you have more seed or you have more time to do it later. Um, I wouldn't push things too much, even if it's warm, because um, with the, with a few exceptions, um, like, you know, I would definitely do a succession of peas earlier than I think I should just to see if they'll grow. And then if they don't, I'll just do another one. Um, but if you don't, you know, it costs money for seed. And if you don't have like an infinite supply of seed, like I do, it's, it's, it's I wouldn't recommend that because you're going to have success with the correct timing and you're going to have only 
if you have success with the earlier timing, yay, because then you have peas a couple weeks earlier. But um, another piece of that is that if if I plant peas like March 5th, March 3rd, yeah, I don't know, let's say March 25th, which would be like the absolute earliest that I would try planting peas. And then I plant more like April 15th, the pea, actual pea that I get <laughs> is only going to be like maybe one week earlier, not three weeks earlier, because plants actually catch up because the date, the dip around Equinox, the way the day lengthening is happening so fast that like by the time they both germinate and kind of start growing, then the days are getting longer and longer. And then the ones that were planted later are going to just like grow faster than the ones that were planted earlier. And you're going to end up like the timing is going to kind of converge towards the end of the life cycle. Does that make sense? So you're only going to gain, like by planting your peas three weeks earlier, you're probably only going to gain one week in harvest earliness. And so it's almost just not really worth it. I don't know if that made sense, but a lot of times I find one planting will just catch up to the next, depending, you know, if it's an early thing because of the, of the day length thing. Um, okay. So here's my, here's my chart. Um, and I'll try it. I'll try to do just like the most, um, you know, kind of obvious things, not like artichokes and celeriac and stuff like that. Um, okay. So onions, <clears throat> And their relatives, I do March 1st to March 15th, sometime in there. And then for my first outdoor ones that I'm gonna going to transplant outdoors, so I plant these in pots indoors, I would, um, about March 15th, I'm going to start my cauliflower, broccoli, kale, and parsley inside. And then also head lettuce. Um, so March 15th would be my first planting. And that would be into like, I really wish I'd brought some props down here, but like, um, do you guys know what six packs are? So a six pack is going to have a cell that's like this big around with, you know, and this deep about. So it's, it's that much soil, you know, it's not that much. And that, that a six pack, when you plant a seed in it, it's, you have about a month before you have to plant it out. And you can up, to, you know, about four, four to six weeks, depending on the thing that before it's like too root bound and too big for the pot. And so that that's why about March 15th, and that way you can then transplant those into the garden, April 15th to May 1st. And those are all things that tolerate frost. So again, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, cabbage. I don't usually do early plantings of cabbage because I don't eat cabbage in the summer. I just eat it. I just grow storage cabbage. But if you wanted like a summer cabbage, you could plant it then. Parsley um, and fennel and head lettuce. And then um, for me, I don't plant, I plant my peppers and eggplants around that same time, but I don't plant my tomatoes until the end of March or the April, of 1st of April because I... I personally don't like potting them up into big pots. I don't have enough room and I grow a lot. If you want to pot your tomatoes up into big gallon pots, then you can plant them earlier, but they grow really fast and you're going to end up with these big gangly plants in, in your pots that are in and it's still too cold to plant them out and then you have to deal with these like oh, i'm so big and i want to get out of this pot but it's too cold to plant still so and always being careful to try not to push too too far forward with everything i mean too far like get excited and plant too early because it bites you in the end um okay so that's that's my that's kind of what happens through March, cold stuff, the 15th, and then hot stuff at the end of the month. By hot stuff, I mean peppers, eggplants, tomatoes. And then in coming into April, um, I would, I could, uh, you know, I plant, you could, Let's see, I'll just say outside. I would transplant 
um, the be you know middle of April to the end of April, I would transplant those things I just mentioned, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, parsley. Um, and then if you, um, and then direct seeding, I would plant my peas and my parsnips in the middle of April. And then usually when I plant peas, I put like a trellis, like a little fence up. And then I plant the peas right along the fence. And then I put a row on either side of the peas just because I'm gonna be watering there anyway. And I put some spinach and arugula and cilantro and things like that, just in that row. Anything that I had in that, in my little, you know, early greens bag, you can just sow spinach, arugula, radishes, all these things are gonna grow and you can cut them. And then by the time they get big, then the peas will be taller. And then by the time the peas get bigger, you'll have be done with those and you can just pull them out. Does that make sense? But that's, I do that every year. I always put like one or two little rows next to my peas because I'm watering there anyway. And it's like, I'm trying to, because I have to drag hoses around that time of year, I'm trying to like consolidate everything. Um, cause I don't have my irrigation system set up yet. So, um, you can also plant. So I have like two carrots. There's two kinds of carrots in my world. There's summer eating carrots and then there's storage carrots. I, I grow enough carrots to store for the whole winter. And I have, you know, hundreds of pounds of carrots in my root cellar at fall time. I mean, I still do. <laughs> um, and so for April 15th, you could do your first succession of summer carrots. You could plant some carrots then. Um, or, you know, anytime April 15th to May 1st. Let's see. And then, <clears throat> and then moving on to May. Um, May 1st. Um, if you're going to transplant basil outside, you could plant basil in pots um, then on May 1st. And then you'd be able to transplant it out like June 1st. Um, and if you're going to direct sow it, then wait, <laughs> you know, wait a lot longer than that. Um, I I plant my, my winter storage cabbage about May 5th in pots and that's going to be the cabbage that I harvest at the end of the season um, for fall storage again for my root cellar but that could just be your second succession if you're only growing a few heads you know two heads in the summer and then two heads in the fall or whatever that would be your later succession um, and then um, corn I don't know if people are growing corn but um, I I've become pretty consistently a I start my corn instead of direct sowing it because of crows mostly and just not having great germination always. But if you're going to start it, you can start it in little cells, um, you know, but you do need, in order to get good pollination with corn, I mean, I wouldn't plant less than 50 plants. So I don't know. It depends how big your garden is, whether corn makes any sense at all. Um, but I wouldn't ever plant less than a hundred personally to get good pollination, but you could get, probably get away with 50 plants. And if it doesn't pollinate well, that means that the ears won't fill out with kernels. They'll be like half empty and it's pointless because it's like not pleasant to eat an ear of corn that isn't full. Um, so yeah, so middle of May, I would start corn inside. And if you're not going to start it inside, I'd, I'd wait till the third week of May to direct sow it outside. Um, and then in that third, I, I used to say June 1st was our last frost date, but I honestly don't adhere to that anymore. Uh, in the last five years, I've been planting, I've been basically anything goes after like May 25th. Um, so it's up to you to decide when the last frost date is, but uh, all those things that we, you know, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, don't want to be put out until after the frost. And then me personally, I'm a fan of direct sowing what I call the curcurbits, which is the 
family that includes squash and cucumbers um, because they have, um, they really don't like being transplanted. They're very sensitive. And they're, and if you, it's one of those same things where you like, if you plant a transplant of cucumbers and then you plant a seed right next to it, the seed will like often exceed the transplanted one because this transplanted one sits there in shock for like three weeks before it does anything because it hates being transplanted. And the seed, if you have nice warm weather for it to germinate, that's important, will just grow and be super happy. And so I, in most, most circumstances, except for sometimes for seed crops, but for, for garden use, I don't transplant cucurbits. I, I direct sow them. So zucchini and cucumbers even, and winter squash, even I direct. So all my winter squash, um, and what you would, what you want to do is you want to like keep your eye on the weather. And if there's going to be, you know, three days in a row, say of like 80 to 90 degree weather, or even 80 degree weather, which often happens in May nowadays, that's when you want to get your cucurbits in, get them in the soil, water them. And they'll, they will, if they get three days of really warm weather, um, they'll germinate. You definitely want to make sure that that's in full sun. Like don't try to like sow a cucumber seed direct in a place that doesn't have full sun. Cause then if it's in the shade half the day, it won't, uh, it won't germinate very well. Cause they really like warm soil, um, you know, and, and make sure you don't bury them too deep because yeah, they just like, if it's moist and then they have that warmth penetrating to the first inch of soil, you know, they'll just, pop real quick um so that i would do like may 25th what else do i direct so okay green beans you can have your you can get your first planting of green beans out there um may 25th potatoes i didn't mention potatoes is one of my bane crops i i feel like potatoes hate me i don't i, I never do <laughs> potatoes but you could definitely, you can potato. So potato leaves are frost tender. So you don't really want them to be in full leaf when it's still frosting, but um, they can be planted, you know, a couple of weeks before the frost because it'll take them a little while to, to grow. So I'd, you could plant potatoes like really starting at the beginning of May. Um, and then also if they, if they did leaf out and then get frosted, they would still keep growing. It wouldn't kill them. Um, so yeah, so then at the end of May, when you think, when it's not really frosty anymore, you can start planting green beans, um, and, you know, anything, you can plant whatever you want, because it's not frosty anymore. For, um, for winter storage, um, beets, I would plant, um, at the end, those also at the end of May. You could start planting beets at the beginning of May, though. Um, and then you could also, and I direct sow my um, winter storage carrots usually at the beginning of June, um, but you can get away with the latest you could plant carrots would be like July 10th or something like that. I wouldn't bother anymore after July 10th, but you could still get a nice crop, you know, if you like have really poor germination, you want to try again, you can keep trying. Um, <laughs> and then on my chart, I also have like, if I'm going to plant like a planting of broccoli to ha harvest in the fall, I would sow that July 1st. And um, I, <clears throat> and then if, I don't know if any of y'all like winter radishes, like watermelon radishes or daikons, those have to be planted um, in the also in the middle of July or the early middle of July, because those are have incredibly low what I said vernalization requirements. If you try planting those in the spring, they'll just go to seed. They won't make a they won't make a radish. You have to wait till it's like hot and not even cold at night, and then they'll grow and make radishes, and then those radishes will keep all winter. Um, let's see. I think I'm kind of overloading all of information here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's 
Well, well, the good thing is this is re on a recording, so folks, you can always go back and watch it again if you didn't catch everything in your notes. And that's well, going to be uh, on Met How at Home YouTube channel. Awesome. I'm just looking at, I want to try to address some of these. So I bought arrow leaf seeds. This is such a common question. I definitely want to address this. A lot of people, you know, we sell a lot of arrow leaf balsam root seed. And then people take them home and they're like, shoot, what do I do with this? <laughs> so um, you all know that's the native wild sunflower that grows on the hills. And um, it is a, a species that will not be transplanted. Do not try sowing it in pots to transplant. It will not survive transplanting. It does not like it. Um, it's a taprooted plant like a carrot. Um, and so the only thing you can really do is you... Um, is you, you have to plant them outdoors in the fall. Um, so you can, what I would recommend if you want to really try to manage them is I would find up wherever you want to do it and like scrape out a little spot, put a few couple, you know, two or three seeds in one spot. Cause we don't know how, you know, they're not going to germinate great. We don't know, you know, it's just a crap shoot really cover them with a little bit of soil and put like a flag by them. And do that in a few different spots where you want them. If you really want to take, you know, really care for them. And then for the next three years, you're going to go out and start looking for seedlings. You might not find seedlings the first year at all, but you might start finding seedlings a second or third year. I mean, this is, this is some patience. I, I, what I do is I just throw them. I don't bury them. I don't do anything. I just throw them in an area that I want them. And then I look, you know, every year I kind of scope around looking for little baby arrow leaves. And if I find one, then I try to weed around it because I want to give it like extra help. Um, but so I, I built this addition on my house in 2015. In the fall of 2015, I, I threw seed out in this area that I call my shrub steparetum. And I... <laughs> And I threw lupin seed and I threw, you know, different buckwheats and all kinds of cool native plants. And um, some of you probably already heard me give this talk at the Conservancy. But um, la this last spring, 20, what was it? 2023, the spring of 2023, I got my first flower from a balsam. So wow. it was eight years later. Um, and I, I, I have probably, you know, I threw a bunch of seed, probably the equivalent of more, you know, more than one of those packets. Um, those packets are pretty small, but I also didn't pay attention to each spot. I planted it and like flag it or anything. I just threw them out. Um, but I probably have maybe 10 seedlings of different ages out there. And I go back and throw more seed every year. I just keep throwing seed at it, you know. And I just hope for the best. There's not a lot you can do, honestly. And, you know, Creatures might eat the seeds, but they're just, they're wild plants, and you just um, you just can't force them <laughs> to grow. They won't. They're not going to cooperate the way the garden cultivars will. Um, and yeah, that's my my experience with balsam. They have you know they're pretty. I'd, I'd say the seedlings are pretty easy to recognize. Even the little babies have that look. That's like an arrow shaped little leaf with like that's like kind of a that really light green like kind of furry light green looking and you can find them if you look for them especially if you flag the spots that you put them i know um my friend in town kate her neighbor um lucy who some of you guys probably know she did that she flagged every place she put them and i think she's had some success she's had some a, a bunch of them <clears throat> come up and it's able to so you go ask her how she did it. <laughs> um, and do you sell arrow leaf seeds? Yeah, we sell those. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. Um, so, um, yeah, we're coming down to the end uh, of our time. Oh here. yeah. Thanks oh yeah, we are. Much. Sorry. No, it's great. Um, Deirdre did mm -hmm. text. She couldn't put in a question in the chat, but I think it deserves its own program about seed saving. And so I don't know if you'd be willing to talk about that a little bit deeper into the season, Annika, but. Um, yeah. I well, I did do, I mean, I, some of you, I think came, I did a talk at the Grange 
I prepared a talk about seed saving um, and I have a whole slideshow. So that would be easy. If that were the topic, I could just okay. show. That show. Um, yeah, let's do that a little deeper in the season, but uh, I just want to address this one from Charlotte. About yeah, I'll, I'll answer Charlotte's question, then we can wrap up. So growing herbs, I mean, every herb is different. So I don't have like a blanket <laughs> statement about growing herbs. Um, but basil, I could address individually. Um, basil is incredibly, you know, frost tender. So you definitely don't want to get it out there when it's cold at all. Um, and so uh, you can um, you can direct sow basil. I've I've had success with that. If you again, it's the same thing with the zucchini, cucumber thing. If you if you watch the weather and say, oh, there's going to be some really warm, really hot days. That's when you'd want it because it wants really warm soil to germinate. Again, direct sowing. I mean, I guess I haven't said this yet, but the direct the 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 balance with direct sowing and transplanting always is going to be is like the be huge part of it is weeds. So if you direct sow your basil in the garden and then it grows, but you don't know exactly what basil seedlings look like, and then a bunch of weeds grow around them, it can be tricky to figure out because weeds are often faster than our plants. So when you grow things from seed directly in the soil, you have to be able to identify what it is so that you can like get the little baby weeds out from around the baby plants. If you, and if you're going to grow basil, um, from starts, you can, um, get, you know, a, get a few little tiny, you know, little four packs or little six pack plastic trays you can just fill those with soil and put them in your windowsill and grow the basils. You know, you probably don't need more than six plants or something. Put the seeds in there. The seeds want to be, you know, 75 to 80 degrees when they're germinating. Um, and, you know, I would put three seeds in at least in each little cell so that if some of them don't germinate, you at least have one plant per cell and then thin them so that there's just one plant in each cell. And then, you know, leave them in, in the, in the windowsill. Um, I wouldn't plant them before May 1st in the six packs. So after May 1st, um, and then, yeah, the windowsill is going to be a problem and they're going to get leggy. So, um, if, you know, at a certain point, like you can even move the six pack outside during the day. Um, so it's in the sun and then you can bring it in at night if it's going to frost, but you definitely don't want like your plants to be in the windowsill for like four weeks. Cause the, the windowsill just does not have adequate light. It just never does to make a really healthy plant. Cause what happens with legginess is your stem is like long and thin. And then it, when you try to transplant it out, it, um, it'll, it could break in the wind. It's just weak. It's just not good. And I guess that's the the one last thing I'd say is like been my, one of my biggest learning curves as a farmer um, over the years is um, transplanting. Like sometimes it's surprising how you can just throw stuff in the ground and it does great. And you think, oh, it's like, you don't have to be tender with these things. Just toss them in there. They're fine. But then I've gotten kind of on that track and then had like a ton of transplant shock. And I realized that you can do that, but only if the conditions are right, which is that you want to make sure the soil you're transplanting into is moist. Do not transplant into dry soil thinking, oh, I'll just turn the water on when I'm done. Water the soil two days before you're mm -hmm. going to transplant. So it's moist when you put the plant in. That's huge. Two, you have to harden things off. You cannot go straight from the windowsill to the garden. You have to put your pot, your your baby plants outside every day for a week. And if it's not freezing at night, you can just leave them outside. But it's better to put them out and then bring them in. Bring them, put them out at night, in during the day for a number of days, like a week, ideally, at least four days you want to do that before you put them out. You're just going to have, they're going to be so much happier when you transplant them. If they're, it's called hardening off. It gives them a, a sense of the outdoors um, somehow, and it just makes them so much better. Um, so those, I'd say those are the two main things. The soil has to be like moist and not, um, and then you have to harden them off. You have to like, 
not just go straight from the windowsill of the greenhouse straight to the garden. It just they won't they won't be successful. Sometimes I find that my basil is just going to seed so fast and some plants will be like really bushy and then others are mm -hmm. more leggy. I'm just wondering if yeah, I'm not. I, I, my, my ideas for that would be may, if you did transplant them, the ones that went to seed might've just been stressed and going to seed mm -hmm. is a sign of stress. Um, mm -hmm. And the other main thing there, the other like, blinking light for me is nitrogen. If they don't have enough fertility and they're stressed, they're uh, nutrient starved, they're going to go to seed. And the big bushy leafy stuff, that's nitrogen that makes bushy leafy basil plants. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen is the thing that feeds leaf growth. And so if you if your soil is poor in nitrogen, you're going to end up with like thinner leaf, thinner, yellower leaves that go to seed faster. And if you have more nitrogen, you're gonna end up with wider, thicker, greener leaves that go to seed slower. Um, so those right. are my two ideas for that. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look we at that. probably call it there, yeah. Yep. Thank you so much, Annika. Wow, that was a wealth of knowledge in 90 minutes. <laughs> and thanks everybody for being here, for your questions, for getting outside and growing food. And uh, may your harvest be abundant. And Annika, I would love to talk seed saving with you and offer yeah. you a program. And I have one thing for everyone too, before you go. If you haven't looked on our website, mvseedcollective.com or Dana's, a Methow Naturalist, dot com maybe i'm not sure any anyway, met how naturalist his website both of those places you can find a seed starting and growing guide for the met how that's like a chart that has every crop and like what date to plant it what kind of fertility it needs everything you need to know and um maybe i could maybe i'll send you a link to ours tracy and you could maybe send it to the to this group or just yeah. Yeah, I definitely can. Yeah, I think that maybe I even put it in the um, I think I put the link to your website in the program description. I'll put a link straight to the growing guide because sometimes it's hard to know. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. so true. That'd be great. Yes, I can absolutely send that. And I can also <clears throat> send the link to this program once I get it onto the YouTube channel. <clears throat> if anybody wants to go back and review. So Okay, everybody's just having lots of um, gratitude for your time today, Annika, and it's been so helpful. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank Thanks. you guys for gardening. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, where's my record button? Anyway, okay, I'm gonna end the program. All right, bye everybody. Thanks so much. Enjoy the day.